Greetings and welcome to the Department of Tangents podcast, a panel discussion with comedians Kathy Ferris, Emily Ruskowski, Aaron Spencer, and Carolyn Plummer with new music from Illuminati Hotties. I'm your host, Nick Zeno. I'll keep the intro short this week since we have just over an hour of interview to get to. This episode marks the very first time the Department of Tangents was recorded live in front of an audience. The Northeast Comic Con and Collectibles Extravaganza expanded its podcast panels and its comedy offerings this year, and I was lucky to nab all four comedians on the Friday night show before they took the stage. I haven't done a lot of panel shows before, but if they're as interesting as this one, I may have to make a point of doing more. Ferris, Ruskowski, Spencer, and Plummer all have great stories of how they got into comedy and found who they were as comedians. Ferris started and then stopped for years due to family obligations. Ruskowski is a social worker. Spencer bombed on purpose her first time on stage. Plummer has worked every kind of room you can imagine from clubs to, as she calls them, dead animal lodges. A good chunk of the conversation was centered around identity and experience. And there were some delightful moments where the comics just asked each other questions and I got to sit back and listen. Stick around after the show for new music from Illuminati Hotties from their album Kiss Your Frenemies. And now, Kathy Ferris, Emily Wiskowski, Aaron Spencer, and Carolyn Plummer. All right, so we can start with introductions. Just our name. If you have an opening statement. I'm I'm it. Emily Ruskowski, and this is my voice so that you can identify it throughout the podcast. I'm Kathy Ferris. I'm sitting right next to Emily, and this is my voice. Uh, I'm Aaron Spencer. I'm sitting right next to Kathy, and this is my voice. Okay. I'm Carolyn Plummer. I'm on the end. I'm sitting next to Aaron. And nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> so, an- another way to introduce you. I went through your bios, oh, no. and I picked That's out. That's also sentence. a good way. <laughs> yeah, to I, picked out, I picked bios. out a sentence. Right. Isn't that the point of? I, I picked out a sentence from each of, of your bios to see if, if maybe you agree with this. If this would be a, a way to explain people, uh, oh. Carolyn, you uh, said to Carolyn, the monumental is easy. It's our existence that's so hard yet so ridiculous. Some women look in the mirror and complain that they aren't pretty enough, not rich enough, not young enough. Carolyn gives her reflection the finger. Is that an accurate rep- representation? Um, that is an older bio that a friend of mine wrote because I had a hard time writing a bio about myself. I think he was trying to capture my attitude, um, uh-huh. and I think he did. I used a lot of big words. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I would say that that catch catches my essence or reflects who I am. Mm-hmm. And, and oh, I have actually realized that I don't I don't have all of your bios because I wrote down Because mine is so long winded you didn't have enough space <laughs> on your sheet. <laughs> I, I, ca- I actually uh, wound up uh, cutting and pasting Kathy's twice so I don't have Aaron. Well that's good. I'm glad that You're happened. Glad that? Well I, you'll have to give you'll have to, to uh, Did you I really have to? Give it give your own introduction. Uh, it, yeah. Yours was, was was fairly short though. You did you didn't have a lot it's short but sweet. I like I like keeping it small. No, you know, it's just and I'm a comedian, I'm transgender and I uh, you know, perform in Boston. That's basically all I write on my bio. Mm-hmm. You know, the facts. Mm-hmm. Right. It, you know, that's all that's really needed. The suspect right. profile, <laughs> really, <laughs> really, pretty much. It's and what I, it's if it's gonna be on my tombstone. If it's not on my tombstone, oh. it's not on my it's not in my bio. Is your Facebook bio will be on your tombstone? That's a that's the new thing. That's, that's right. The and the number of likes it got. Uh, right. It'd be great if you had a number of likes on your tombstone that changed <laughs> that you could actually. Right. Hashtag. There was like a chisel next to it, and you could yeah. do another mark. How many people enjoy that this person is dead? It just keeps, it keeps, it keeps changing. All right, and then Kathy Ferris is a suburban housewife and mother of two teenagers. She shares her unsolicited advice and wisdom about everyday things from calcium supplements to the political awfulness behind book groups. You stand by that as your... Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Yeah. Uh-huh. In fact, um, my, uh, I had my kid write that, so uh-huh. I mean, you know it's real. And yours was perhaps the shortest. <laughs> I mean, you just said Emily is a Boston-based stand-up comedian. 
She is hilarious and extremely fancy. Yes, that is accurate. Uh, that was a bio pulled Again, somebody else wrote that for me. Yeah, I had a hard time uh, writing my own. Yeah, for someone wrote that. Uh, <laughs> someone wrote that for me uh, for a, a show I was doing that was for like a women's conference, and they were like, "This is what I'm going to say about you." And I was like, "That's better than anything I've said about me." So. <laughs> uh, she said, "You're yeah. hilarious and fancy." I was like, "Yeah, that's that's what I want to project into the world. So let's put it out there." I think writing your your own bio is probably one of the worst jobs mm. yeah, that you will weird. ever have to do. And it would be strange for a comedian who spends so much time on stage trying to capture who you, that's basically the gig, trying to capture who you are. Right. And then you sit yeah. down and try to write it in five sentences. I imagine it's a fairly, it's it's doubly awful for a comedian to do. Yeah, it feels weird to be like, I don't want, I'm going to get gendered right away. And I'll be like, shitty open mic dudes could write a great <laughs> bio for themselves. Uh, this guy's the funniest guy. You should book me. I'm the funniest bro you've ever seen. Like, they have no problem. And there could be a woman with, like, 14 TV credits. And she's like, I've I've played uh, the comedy studio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like, right. and women, I think women tend to under, we feel weird. You feel weird saying, like, this is how great I am. It feels yeah. weird to do that. Well, my friend who wrote mine is in a band, and he writes songs. Mm -hmm. And he's a really good writer. He writes for magazines and stuff. But he just uses big words. He uses big words in his songs, and his uh -huh. bandmates make fun of him. They're like, why would uh -huh. you use that word? That doesn't rhyme with anything. <laughs> so he wrote it a long time ago, but it, I've tried to change it over the years, and sometimes I'll send a short bio for a show I'm on, and I still just cut something out of what he wrote. <laughs> I Can't write music it. as well, and I, every time I've uh, every time I've tried to write a bio for myself, it, it might seem okay that day. And the, like the one that, that's up on my Facebook yeah. now, and and uh, the Reverb Nation and all that is utterly terrible. I don't know what to say to myself because I, 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 I get I get anything that that I say to try to to praise myself seems like oh you're. Yeah. I feel like I'm bragging. Yeah. yeah. I wonder yeah. if we're all afraid that like our middle school bullies. Are like in the audience <laughs> listening to our bios being read. I'm like, that's not true. <laughs> Everything you said, that person's a wicked loser. Tell everyone, put that in your bio. <laughs> like, I completely. That's exactly like anything I write. I always think that there's these other women at home reading my stuff, following me. Because every now and then I will get a post from somebody or just like this obscure message. Like, I I listened to that podcast that you were in and I really liked it. And then I think, what did I say in that one about that person? <laughs> or they'll like a, a weird thing, but it's like they're following, they're stalking, fact-checking everything that you write. It's stressful, uh -huh. yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they have the time, because I would do that too. <laughs> <laughs> you would stop somebody and, and well, you like would call, call them hobby, out for, you know? <laughs> like, call like oh I heard you said you were very funny mm, I'll be at your show I'm just interested, we'll see I'm interested in Linda and her Amway career <laughs> you, know? you gotta, gotta, gotta keep it the facts who you are yeah, your suspect name profile. <laughs> your age maybe they you know, can't refute anything color. you've said. In that's your bio. right. Oh, I leave my age out on purpose. <laughs> uh, well, that that's a big yeah. problem for a lot of people. They don't want to know. Yeah. They don't want people to know. And it, it's not it, it's just not just uh, uh, female comics either. I've had yeah. male comics who have been. Uh, I've asked the, their age, and they don't want it. Yeah. In an article. Yeah. And it can be kind of huh. tricky because in the globe, they they generally want you to to put somebody's age in. Um, and the, the and it's a harder question to ask than yeah. than you would think. I can ask, I, you know, I've asked people much more personal questions, <laughs> and, and with, well, with yeah. no problem. And then I've said, then I've felt nervous about asking, "What's your age?" Yeah, Do you hear that? I am oh. thirty four. <laughs> I'm so brave. <laughs> yes. I, I think the fear is, you know, you don't want to like, you don't want industry to like somebody to be like, well, she was funny, but. She She's doesn't 34. fit our demographic. <laughs> like, That's the thing you worry about, demographics and all that yeah. crap. How many good years can we really get out of her comedy? Like, right. Do we really want to even... Probably not many. No, yeah, right. I'm <laughs> working up now. I know, but you really can't hide it either. I mean, I remember right. when I started and I was 44, so I was old then, older then. And I, I remember saying to myself, you know, there is no shade of lipstick that's going to cover 
44. Uh-huh. <laughs> you, you just got to be it, you know? But yeah. you, and you started and then stopped and then started, right? You started young I and start, then... I started, yeah, like at 23. I just started at a blip, and then I was like, I'm going to get back to this. And 19 and a half years later, I went back to it, yeah. Wow. And what, wow. what did you think starting 19 and a half years later? What, what did... What did you think your your career path would be at that point? Um, I didn't think I would even be having that. I, I just did it because, you know, it was on my to-do list. I always wanted to do it. Um, you know, I've been trying to encourage my kids to do, you know, get out there in the world and try things that they've always wanted to do. So I felt like a hypocrite. So I just took a class, and from there I just – the scene here is so good that um, it allowed me to just keep going and – there was all these open mics, and then made local shows, and then you're able to just kind of, um, you know, improve your craft, hone your craft. How did everybody else start? I know I've, I've, I've asked you before, yeah. and you said yours was a New Year's resolution. It was, yep. My friends were like, you're funny, and you have to do stand-up, and that's your resolution for the year. And I waited until December of that <laughs> year, 2009, and I did it like the last – I and I didn't – when I started, I didn't know – like you could repeat material, so I went uh-huh. to like this open mic, and I thought I had to do a completely new. Fi- so I, was I thought writing, that at right? first too. No yeah. one tells you you're trying to hone your your, your yeah. jokes. So you find that out later. Like you, yeah. you don't just play one song once. Right. You know, all that. Right. I've had friends who have said, yeah. "Well, I saw this comedian twice, and they did the same material both times. They're terrible." <laughs> I like, try to well, mix no, it that's, up. That's what happens. Right. Yeah. That's People what, want you know, different content. Yeah, I went to see the Rolling Stones, and then they played Satisfaction. Yeah. I mean, Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what are they doing? Why, they, why aren't they playing? It's so weird that the difference between the music and the comedy world. Nobody in the comedy world they want. They think you want to yeah. new stuff all the time, and then in the music world, they, they want you to. They, play they didn't play stuff. my favorites. <laughs> yeah. what the, uh, but I think that's changing in comedy now too, though. Where, it's, especially with like Netflix and these people having, you know, a new special every year, they're they're just churning out new material. Yeah. Um, at this pace, it's just um, like light speed, don't you think? It well, is, yeah, and it's getting. It's, it's getting not all good quality, either. Yeah, yeah, the quality, quality is of suffering. comedy is suffering. Yeah, because yeah. we're we're so focused on like new stuff, new stuff, new stuff, and the quantity you can produce. Right. That really, we are. I think it is taking a hit, and it has to. You can, who can write a new year? Like, how there's many only a couple people that can that write a new of. hour every right. year. That's crazy. Yeah. Like Dave Chappelle. <laughs> Yeah. Who could write two hours and go in, out. And, yeah. well, and, he's, even, and he's even been criticized that, that maybe he should have just released one special. Yeah. With right. The better mm-hmm. stuff. Chris Rock got criticized for his last special. I think a for, lot of people are, yeah. The one I thought that it was really just, good. I thought it was good too, but people are like, oh, it's, it's too racist on the <laughs> other side. Like people mm-hmm. thought that it was too much talking about him. Being black, I'm like he is black. <laughs> you notice the title of his, some of his other specials. I know. I'm like, do you not know who Chris something. Rock is? Yeah. <laughs> it's you know, it's part of his uh, wheelhouse, kind of. Yeah, I it's thought good. it was good, but you know, everybody has an opinion, and yeah. comedy subjective. So, well, about the the new material, you know, uh, Bill Burr was trying to do that one a year thing, and until one point he said, you know, I don't, I don't really need to, if I don't have the full hour this year, maybe I'll just wait till next year. It's, yeah. Yeah. perfectly okay to wait two years before specials. Yeah, and he's great. I and with creative guy. pursuits, I think even right with songwriting, like if you just force yourself to, like it's basically any good, any good sort of creative work comes out of some sort of authentic emotion, right? So if you're like, I'm just going to sit and force myself to feel something, mm-hmm. I don't know how that works. You know, like I don't know if that's as good as something that just developed because it, it was organic and it just happened. And and you share it that way, mm-hmm. you know. I don't think that forced stuff makes sense for what we do. Yeah, maybe not. Uh, on the on the other end of the spectrum, novelists will say all the time, "You have to just sit and keep writing. The you have to get the thing." Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's one thing. We're we're just getting to the end of Nano Rhino National yep. Novel Writing Month, which is the idea that you write two three thousand words every day and have fifty thousand words at the end of the of the month, so that you have basically a novel 50,000 is sort of a low end of commercial it's more like 80 70 80,000 what you need but yeah with with, with comedy I guess not everybody's comedy is personal either true. which is true but I 
and you would be tempted to say most of the good stuff is because you would be you would look at you know well, Richard Pryor and say that's the, the deeply personal stuff. You would look at Gary Goldman, uh, Gary mm -hmm. Go, who's gotten much more personal, very much than, than, yeah. than, than when he first on. started. Yeah. Um, yeah, even Jim Gaffigan has gotten more autobiographical yeah. as he's gone on, which is deceptive because it's it's the surface concept is he might still be talking about food, but now he's talking about feeding his six kids in New York City and how you how you have to chain them all together to get them anywhere to, sort of, uh, yeah. to, to get them. But yeah, that's that. I, I don't want to skip over the the how the getting into comedy stories, the impetus of getting into comedy. There must have been an impulse that you thought, okay, this is something I want to try. Yeah. I've, mm -hmm. I've always wanted to be a comic, and I did a lot of theater when I was a kid, mm -hmm. and I always liked it when I was the center of attention because I'm the youngest of three kids, mm -hmm. but I didn't know how to do it. I watched a lot of comedy. I went to college, and then when I graduated from college, I got a lot of people, friends from college that said, you should do stand-up, and I didn't know how to do it. So I was right. waiting tables, and I saw an ad for a class, and I took a class with a comic who doesn't really do comedy anymore. His name's Dave McLaughlin. He was a Boston comic from mm -hmm. back in the 90s and uh so i took a class and at the end you got to perform and he helped you figure out how to write jokes and the structure of a joke and i did it and then i met george ham who's a comic out of maine and then i started doing open mic nights and then i was just hooked after that mm -hmm. and but i started in new hampshire then i moved to portland maine and then i came down to boston so i've been in different markets mm -hmm. But and that was my story. But the class was what gave you the, the class was, is what gave me the confidence to get on stage, because and put it all together. Because I didn't know how to do that. I'm like, how do you mm -hmm. do that? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like you're in New York and everybody knows a comic. You know what I mean? Like uh -huh. it's a totally different thing. I'm in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. I was like, how do I do that from Wolfboro, New Hampshire? Uh -huh. And then I was driving to the vault a lot, and I got a lot of stage time. And then I met bookers, and then it just progressed from there. Mm -hmm. And. Aaron, well, I mean, I, I got into stand up because I missed I missed it actually. I uh, I, I uh, when I was younger, I uh, started working at a Boy Scout camp. I worked there for about seven summers, and all I did there was just make kids laugh. That was basically all it was: is trying to mm -hmm. teach kids a communications merit badge, most boring thing in the world. <laughs> so all I did was turn it into like a big, you know, kind of stand up set. And did that? Did sketch comedy there? Did did everything there? Did that? throughout my entire high school, college, bit of middle school. Mm. And then eventually, later on, when I was out of camp for a few years, I just really missed being on stage and making people laugh, so I mm. got back into it through stand-up. You did all of that in, in camp exclusively when you were? Yeah, when I, was, when I was younger. I didn't do any, do any stand-up outside of camp. I didn't do any comedy outside of camp. It wasn't mm. until, you know, I, I, you know, it was all summer long. I wasn't really doing much <laughs> else. I just... It was that in college, but um, no, it was it was years later when I eventually got into got into trying stand up as a way to get back into that. Mm -hmm. And your first gig, you said you bombed yes, on purpose. I bombed on purpose. Uh, I it was uh, it was at a local uh, local bar that does a that does a mic, and I'd seen comics go up there week after week. Same comics. Sometimes they bring the house down. Sometimes not a single laugh for the same joke even so mm -hmm. i kind of wrote myself a set and waited until there was a night where these experienced comics i've been doing for five years weren't getting anything i'm like this is my night mm -hmm. so then i asked to go up and he, he put me up and i and i got basically nothing and i'm like I'm just as good as they are uh, <laughs> <laughs> the great equalizer the open That's right. mic yeah. i'm not good but none, neither are any of these other people and they're not quitting so why should i That's exactly, exactly. Sort of, so I just started, kept on doing it, kept the stuff that kind of worked, and went from there. Uh huh. Who else took classes? I took class. You yeah. took it. You teach class. Yeah, too. I teach class. Yeah. Uh, uh, what is that? What is your approach to that? Well, what I liked about when I first started, I like read a book about it, and then I took this class, and I am very much about process and the structure of a joke, and I loved how to write a joke. Um, so. I spend a lot of time on that piece, on the mechanics of a joke, and just getting comfortable on stage, like how to work the mic. You know, there's there's some things that you just can't teach. It's just a matter of, you know, here's what here's what stand up is about, and 
you know, here's the formula of a joke, and here's the mic, and you mm -hmm. can't avoid any of these things. Um, so just teaching some basics, and from there it's about, this is as much as I can give you, and the rest, here's where open mics are, and, uh -huh. you know, here's where you go. But I spend a lot of time on, on the joke writing part, because that's where you can, that's something you can teach. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say the joke's going to be good, but you know, if you can look at something that people are doing and maybe the structure's off a little bit because the keyword's not in the right place or there's too many off, too many words mm -hmm. or the setup is, doesn't make any sense, um, you can kind of cut through some of that. So mm -hmm. I spend I have a lot of time on that. But I personally do that too. I, I love to write the joke. I love chasing the joke. Mm -hmm. um, probably more than even performing the joke. Mm -hmm. I like to do that. Do you find that, that process reliable for is there a transferable process that's reliable for everybody no i don't even find it reliable for me i just enjoy <laughs> i just enjoy doing that because the other piece of it which is so important too is your stage presence and your delivery mm -hmm. and connecting with an audience and you know i i personally have found like some people can write a good joke but then there are some people who have this amazing stage confidence and this presence and they can connect with people and you go down these roads, and you might not be able to write a good joke yet, but if you can connect with an audience, you're going to start getting a little thing. But if you can write a joke and you start working on your stage presence, you're still going to get some. So you kind of parallel, but on mm -hmm. different strengths in a way. Mm -hmm. Because there are some people, you know, you, you could probably watch uh, Jimmy Carr, for example, and, mm -hmm. and see that, that, that sort of set up that, that very crisp yeah. joke structure uh, and say, oh, that's how you do it. But then if you watch Dave Chappelle... Mm -hmm. The, those the, those are the kind of Dave Chappelle are the kind of comics that are kind of dangerous for newbies. I think that make them think, oh, I just get up there and, and talk. talk. Yeah. 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 No, we've all <laughs> seen you're one of the, the like super confident drunk guy oh, who's yeah. like, oh, they're gonna love this, and it's just some dummy who went to the mic or thinks every show's a mic. Yeah, have you oh, been yeah. to shows like that yeah. where someone yeah. like will go like a drunk audience dude? will go up to a showrunner and be like, yo, can I get five minutes? Mm -hmm. And they're like, I don't... Sometimes people are just bewildered and they're like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've seen that happen a few times. Sure, buddy, go up. And I always love My to answer's see always no. I, yeah. That's a good answer. Nope. <laughs> well, because time is different behind the mic, as you know. And oh, yeah, they deflate think, right away. When they think, oh, just five minutes. I've got so much. I could probably do 15. You know what I mean? I've done mm -hmm. my cousin's bar mitzvah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've seen that at, at open mics and the, the people will say after I'll ask I've, I asked somebody once well they found out that I write about comedy they go oh, why don't you write about me because well, uh. I, I just met you at the same open mic I'm playing <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know what that says about me because I don't want to uh, for, for one thing so uh, the other thing about how much material do you have you man I could do an hour like not based on the seven minutes you yeah. just did you can't, yeah. you can't do an hour they think they can there are a lot of people I think who play for just their friends they, their yes, friends follow sure. them to these open mics yeah. mm -hmm. and they've always got a cheering section and one of the saddest things you'll ever see is when that cheer the first time that cheering section isn't there yeah like, so I you know I was at the office and you know there's the coffee machine and I said uh, whatever the dumb thing is and then nobody yeah. laughed and then there's, there's this little there's a little thing that starts going up in their head you can see in their eyes like uh, oh, oh, no yeah. one laughed no one laughed everybody always laughs at this at work what the hell am I gonna do that, that sort of that that swimming that starts it's just yeah. heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's fun though sometimes. It depends on, <laughs> when yeah, really it depends on who, before, if they're arrogant oh, and it yeah. happens, you're like, hey, finally. <laughs> I did see that yeah. once. There was a guy that just started, you know, there, there are people who will come into a room and make fun of it because they've been there. Uh, you know, DJ Hazard would do the, the around the room thing in yeah, the studio. Yeah. Yeah. And there are people who bust the, the, the club owner's chops. Uh, I saw a guy walk into Motley's. Uh, remember, uh, yeah. uh, I love Tim Motley's. McIntyre's in, the, in John Lincoln's place once. And just... He asked to do time, and he he was like he was on a guest spot, and he just made fun of the the room for. Why would you waste your time? And, and the, guest uh, nobody liked it, and it was a sort of he was he was somebody who literally swaggers on stage when they walk around, <laughs> and it was it just gets to it it just becomes a sad thing where everybody's it looks like everybody's watching Schindler's List if you yeah. were to just take. A, <laughs> <laughs> if you were to just take a picture of the audience <laughs> and tell people this is a, this is these are people at a comedy show, they would never, never. go to a comedy show. No, yeah. based on 
I've what seen those that people look like. You might have seen that actual knife. <laughs> well, people think. I think the people who do that mistake they they miss the fundamental difference between hanging out in a crowd, making everyone laugh at a party, and being funny on stage. Yeah. Is that totally there's no back animal. and forth dialogue? You don't have anyone else to play off of. I mean, a little bit in a limited capacity with crowd work, but there's no, there isn't the back yeah. and forth and things mm-hmm. to play off of mm-hmm. when you're in a conversation with somebody. All the energy has to come from you, mm-hmm. and I think unless you fundamentally understand that before you get on stage, you're setting yourself up for failure. Uh-huh. Not, not only that, but also there's no shared experience. Yes. I think that's a big difference between, yeah. like if you're hanging out with your buds or you're at a party somewhere, you yep. have a shared Experience, oh, energy, yeah. everybody's there. They know the same people. Right once you get yeah. on stage, we don't know you at all. Yep, right. It's going right. to take a lot of setup for you to explain who Cheryl in accounting is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I, I have friends that, that'll be like, oh, you should do this on stage. This is a bit. It's not a bit. It's, it's, not a, right. it's a story yeah. about Steve yeah. in a Facebook post. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you all get that a lot? Do you get, I mean, you, oh, you, yeah. you just I'll went through Thanksgiving. Yeah. Did, you, you had, did you get relatives saying, hey, you should use this? The thing I just said about the turkey. (laughs) I actually had, um, because people say it all the time, like, here's something for your skit. Yeah. Um, I hate the word skit. (laughs) About a year ago, I was getting my kitchen remodeled, and my contractor uh, had found out that I do stand-up. And he came in one day, and um, he told a couple of jokes. um, And he's like, you can have those. I'm like, oh. (laughs) I love that. Oh, thanks. I don't want those. And about, <laughs> but about three weeks later, he came in and he's like, "Hey, um, can I talk to you for a second? Like, yeah, I think. Like, um, listen, um, I feel really bad about this, but I'm gonna have to take those jokes back because <laughs> I'm thinking about doing comedy now. And I want to say to him, like, you know, listen, I don't do a lot on like minor traffic violations <laughs> or the disabled, so." <laughs> <laughs> or the disabled. I mean, I that would be a powerful combo. Uh, right. Are you sure? That could have been a start of another five minutes for you. I don't know you're you could have combined the two. I don't even. She's know how the one who back does back the thing right? about the disabled guy at the traffic stop. It's awesome. <laughs> Wasn't even that good. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, need those awesome. back. <laughs> <laughs> and he was. And he was. He was sorry yes, that he, had, he was. He felt really bad about it. He stole those comedy gems but from I'm gonna you. I'm going to have to take it back. And I, in some ways, I was thinking, That's like, how be... do you take back? How do you know I'm not doing that? You right. know what I mean? You should have said just huh? to, to screw with him. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to keep them. I've been doing them, and they're very, very funny. <laughs> I, I already <laughs> gave them on the, I I already like, them oh, on the Tonight Show. Now yeah, when people see you, I'd love to give them. them back, but I don't have them anymore. I gave them to a friend of mine <laughs> in Branson, Missouri. <laughs> They're there already was, in the trash. That's what <laughs> I, mean. yes. I, I don't think I can pull them out. <laughs> but uh, how much do you draw from from real life, and how much is imagination, and, and how much of who you are on stage is you, and how much is some heightened, idealized version of you? I'm me. I would say most of my stuff, I talk about my family a lot. It's personal. And I'm sort of a storyteller comic. So mm-hmm. it's a story that's been exaggerated or made larger than life. Yeah. But there's an element of truth in almost every joke that I tell. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where it, it comes from. But I wouldn't say that it's exactly me. I'm like quieter in real life, but uh, <laughs> bigger on stage. But it's a bigger version of me. Mm-hmm. It's not like, because I'm not political, I'm not um, like one thing. I'm more of like just perspective and personal story. Mm. I sound really boring when I say that, mm. but. Um. Well, you did, de- you're, you're, I hope you, you don't mind if, uh, if I tell people your opener. You can you, tell, you, yeah. You, well, your frequent opener, I don't know if it's still. I don't do it all the time. It depends on who <laughs> goes before me. Well, yeah, you, <laughs> you will frequently come on and say that, uh, you know, I'm the, and deadpan, I'm the high energy portion, portion of, the, of, the of, the, yeah. of the show. Yeah. And I, I, it made me think when I was uh, putting together questions for this, is that how you see yourself? You're I think of, sometimes I just need people to get used to the way, the cadence of my voice, because if I go after someone who's 
lit up the room with all this energy, and then I come in with my low energy, like matter of fact kind of way that I tell my jokes. It doesn't always work. It's it's a crutch. I fully admit that that's a crutch to get a laugh right out of the gate and then feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but also which is why I don't do it all the time mm-hmm. anymore. But it's also okay to establish who you are. Yeah, that's, right yeah. that's right the other that. thing I'm like, doing. But it I is kind okay. of a crutch. And you like should a, get a laugh like immediately, when, like yeah. just to prove to the audience, hey, I'm funny. Yeah, and that that's I think that comes from um, when people introduce you. This is this is going to be I'm going to play the woman card now. But a lot of times when have people, it, I'll, I'll pass it you down to you. Say. I keep it at a all times. A lot time. of times when people is it just the one card. Yeah. There's a couple. I have a whole deck but, um, <laughs> ready. With when people the introduce you as a woman and mention you're a woman, I had someone introduce me once seven times. They mentioned I was a woman. I was like, you're gonna know that when I walk <laughs> out. Um, and Dom Herrera was actually there. It was at the old Comedy Connection. He goes, "Do you oh. like that intro?" I go, "No, it sucks." And like he kept almost bringing me up too, which is also annoying. So it was like I couldn't get up there, and he kept mentioning I was a woman. I was like, what, Just "In what context? Bring... What was the how? how this could next you fit... woman works all over New England, and she's really funny and." She's a woman. <laughs> like it was just like uncomfortable. So a lot of times you you kind of step in, you. you step into a hole, and and if the audience is male and they're they, there's still a stigma that women aren't funny. That mm. stigma is still there. It's not yeah. as bad as it was when it was like the early '90s, and there were a lot of bad female comics out there doing all the same joke. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about. But like, it's sort of like what you were allowed to talk about as a woman, too. Right. Like and there's it's always changed been... a lot since then. But you are in a hole sometimes, so you kind of have... And I get this a lot after shows. I don't usually like female comics, but I thought you were funny. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. do. Which too, they yeah. then yeah. tell you is a compliment. You're like, well, it doesn't sound like a compliment. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. I just want to be funny and to be a comic. But there's still the woman... You know, she's a comedian. I'm like, no, I'm just a comic. Yeah. I just want to tell my stories. You know, from uh, from my perspective as a journalist uh, covering comedy, I've covered uh, that sort of topic uh, somewhat frequently. But I've also wondered, at some point a few years ago, uh, uh, looking at gender and looking at race, wondering, all right, well, if I ask these questions in this story about somebody. It's taking focus away from who they are personally. Uh, and am, am I perpetuating, if I ask somebody, if there's not something that, that happened in the last couple of weeks that's, that Jerry Lewis blew up again and said something stupid, right. <laughs> and I ask that question, what do you think about this, are women funny? Am I perpetuating that topic? Am I keeping the, the ball in the air by asking that of someone? I, yeah, I, I hate that question. We talked, you know, like, I've yeah, I, I, I hate, hate that question too, yeah. because mm-hmm. male comics don't get asked that question. Right. Are male comics funny? Like the they most just, often answer is no. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like it's it's like I'm not a unicorn. I'm just a comic. Like and I specifically uh, had you on because you were a unicorn. <laughs> but this um, is embarrassing. So, now. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Did you not read her bio? <laughs> <laughs> But it is like a unique thing that you always get that question. Like, do you uh-huh. find women funny? It's like well, I find some women funny because comedy is subjective. I find right. other women not funny at all. And I find male comics funny, and I find other male comics not funny at all. Like, why does it have to be a female comic or a comedian? Like, why can't right. it just be a comic? Like, oh, no, I don't like that comic, or no, I don't right. like that comic. But please don't mention I'm a woman seven times and half introduce me for ten minutes, and I'm sitting there going, what the f? <laughs> Just bring me up. You know what I think That's is interesting that you said is that because we I hear this too. It's like oh, um, I normally don't like uh, women comedians, yep. but I thought you were funny. I think it's we have this like as though genetically we are not prone to like prone to being as funny as men, but good for us, right? You know, and it's kind trust of, me, it's better now than it was. And I think yeah. that this is across the board. And sometimes I feel it more from women in the audience more than men in the mm-hmm. audience mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um it's harder to win them over they're like oh that was that was good yeah, yeah. that was a really good for good you good. i liked that yeah. oh, great. Women have said, i've had women say yep. i don't like women comics but you i've were had funny. that too. too from women that always women say that that yeah, always so bumps me it makes the me think that like is it just something guys that we just kind of just thought was there you mm-hmm. know but it's the same as in other fields. It's it's 
when the first woman went to the Citadel. Oh, well, she couldn't do it, so no women can. If one woman comic is is not funny, every woman comic's not we're funny. All like, G.I. Janes. Yeah, we're all just so, like, <laughs> yeah. we're every, all G.I. Janes out there just trying to prove your point. It is like, and it sucks because again, one male comic cannot be funny, and you're like, you're, people aren't like, oh well, I don't like male comics anyway. They don't generalize like they do for women, and I yeah. think. Part of, I think, it bothers me whenever we say female, I never call, say I'm a female, like, I'm a woman, like, I'm a human, so I call myself a woman, right? Right. So, but I don't like, like, whenever we say female comic, we don't say male comic like Carolyn said, or and Kathy said, because the de- as long as the default is male, as long as the default is straight, white, male, everyone else is a niche, Mm-hmm. And then that's when people are like, oh, I don't like niche comedy. Like, oh, like women isn't a genre mm-hmm. no. of comedy. And it and should, it should, right? Be. Like, if you're if you're a person of color, that shouldn't that's not a genre of comedy. If you're LGBTQ, that's not a genre of comedy. And I think that's the problem. Is as long as some people can definitely make it into that. Oh yeah, there yeah are, I think there that's are definitely there's markets the for black that. Comic, yeah. Absolutely, the, the yeah. gay comic. The, there are definitely people who stick with a, a certain. But they're also Brand. just talking about their experience. And right. again, that experience is only other as long as the default normal, quote unquote, I don't know mm. why I'm doing quotes. We're doing a podcast. Mm. I did air quotes with my hand <laughs> on an audio only recording. It will get, it, it's going to be in stereo, so they'll be able to feel, feel it. Feel the wind of Because you're doing it very close to the microphone. Perfect. There it is, guys, for you listening. That little <laughs> but the, <laughs> There it is. But yeah, as long as we, we consider straight white male default or quote normal comedy Mm -hmm. then we consider everyone else's experience like oh well i should only listen to this if i'm into that kind of experience but those experiences are just as normal and just as valid and as long as we keep othering everybody i think that's a problem i think it's about how we respond to it though like when we did that when we got interviews after the boston comedy festival and being women in the boston comedy festival and they asked us that you know, the next day I was like, you know, the next time I'm asked that, I'm just going to say, well, why don't you come see for yourself? Here's where we're at. Yeah. Um, That's, I, I've answered that way. Yeah. That's a good I, answer. I wish I, like, was more on my feet Because I'm like, time. well, you might not like my humor, but, you know, people think I'm funny, but it, you'd have to right. form your own opinion right. after seeing it. Well, it's, it comedy doesn't yeah. have what music has. As much as people might complain about genre labels in, in music, they're helpful in that, you know, uh, if I could say Americana music and people have kind of an idea mm-hmm. of what that means, you could say rock music, you can say rap, and there's still a, a fair, fairly, you know, diverse sort of diaspora within in, in each one of those things. Sure. But comedy is just sort of comedy to people. Mm-hmm. There's not, there aren't a lot of highly developed genre right. labels. I don't think I think you're right. I don't think there are highly developed labels, but I think you can like compare two comics and say that they're they have a similar comedic style. Yes. I think right. that's totally possible. You can also compare topics for comedy. There's some very political comics out there, then there's some that don't do any politics. So mm-hmm. I think there is a way to genreize comedy a bit, but the, Male think, and female is not a great way to right, do it. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I, I've just never understood that. And I think that's just something that's always going to be there. Mm-hmm. And you just have to just keep doing your thing. Mm-hmm. You know? I think political comedy and clean comedy are the only two sort of la- labels that seem to be yeah. in sort of uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, common everybody. vernacular yeah. that yeah. people will know. Yeah, I think you're right. Right, because you get booked that way. Like, oh, I'm looking for a clean comic. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. I shower every day, so I guess I <laughs> Well, uh, Aaron and Kathy, about being who you are on stage, mm-hmm. what is the, the difference? If the, Is there any difference between who you guys are on stage and who you are off stage? Yeah, you know, for me, um, I people will say, oh, I really like your character because on stage I'm more edited. And, uh-huh. But honestly, uh, and I think it was my, my 19-year-old who said it, she's like, Basically, you're who you are when you're picking me up from school at 2.30 in the afternoon mm-hmm. and you're just tired of having to, like, pander to everybody else and uh-huh. you're just saying what you're going to say. That's how. That's just how you are. And that's why I write, like, I deliver the way I write. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like a sliver of who I am, but I think I am 
introverted and shy in private that I only show that on stage and the rest of the time I try mm -hmm. to be polite and politically correct and you know shiny and polished and look like I've got my stuff together when I probably don't. So it's just like a, mm -hmm. it's just one part of me, but it's the most comfortable part of me. She said that um, I'm going to, going to misattribute the quote, but there was the, the that uh, sort of old riff about be normal in your regular life so you can be weird in your art. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's, that's cool. sort of. I like that. There's that. I, if if I have a vague idea of who said it, but I can't remember it. It's going <laughs> to sound incredibly pretentious if I if I. Guess so, <laughs> yeah. But that that that's an idea that, that there are people, you know, that, that that are incredibly weird on stage who are just that's that's just what they do. That's that's the job. Yeah, is, is to be something strange. Well, Bobcat Goldthwait is like that. Like in when he did his stand up and he was so strange on on stage. I've met him yeah. outside of comedy, and he's he's. Really smart, really normal, kind of shy, uh -huh. and the stuff he was doing in the, you know, when he was in police academy and stuff like that, like that's his character. That's yeah. not who he is as a person. When he got trapped in it after a while, he definitely yeah. wanted to get rid of it, and it took him the long time. You know, I've seen him on stage say, "This is my normal voice." Yeah, exactly. I, I interviewed Gilbert Gottfried years ago, mm -hmm. and somebody else answered the phone and said, "I'll, you know, I'll give you the, the Gilbert," and. He's in. He's got an incredibly smooth, yeah. beautiful voice. But they want to hear. Yeah, that. I opened for him for a few years ago down in in Baltimore. Before I like um, like Carol and I did a different market before Boston, mm -hmm. and I opened for him. And he was like very, like you said, like very calm, <laughs> soft spoken. We talked about uh, how he hates anti vaxxers and I was like, me too. And like, it was a great, like, really nice conversation. I, and thought, I, was like, wow, like, I thought somebody was putting me on when they handed it. Yeah. I, I didn't think it was him yeah. like, for, for a while. And I asked him, you know, are people surprised when they hear your real voice? He had a great answer. He said, I, I think they're just surprised I'm not a duck. <laughs> 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 there are some people that are like, uh, Louis Black is a very calm, just a uh, wonderful guy until you start talking about politics. And then yeah. the guy on stage comes out. The first time I interviewed him years and years ago, you know, as like as a, as a very laid back conversation. And this was during the New Hampshire primaries in like '99 or whatever it was. And uh, the the big the big thing that year was everybody was cooking breakfast for people. That was what to oh, make the candidates look normal. <laughs> so it was this very calm, serene conversation. Very, uh, you know, uh, talking about the mechanics of comedy and, and stuff that goes on in the Daily Show. And we started talking about. The, uh, the primaries that he just flipped because he was there covering it for the Daily Show. These fucking people flip a pancake and thinks it makes a fucking human. <laughs> just turned into this completely different guy. <laughs> like, all right, so that's so that guy on stage is still you too. It's 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 probably not terribly exaggerated for who you yeah. are just by your natural reaction, but it's a, just a, as Kathy said, the sliver mm. of, yeah. of who you are. I really like him. I think he's great. Yeah. And I, I like that his energy matches what he's saying. Like, yeah. there's some comics, their energy doesn't match what they're saying. Like, uh -huh. they're angry about something they shouldn't be angry about. Like, he gets fired up, and that's how it comes out. Uh -huh. But he believes that, and he is behind that 100%. Right. And he's, such, he's so funny, and he's smart. And, and we haven't gotten to, to you yet about who you are on stage as opposed to who you are off stage. Yeah, I, I think... I think I am myself on stage mm -hmm. in a very similar ways to everyone else. I, I probably a bit exaggerated mm -hmm. and definitely, I mean, I'm not, not, not a hundred percent myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, you know, when I'm on stage and telling one joke after the other, that's not my real life. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a constant barrage of jokes, but, uh -huh. but it, it, I'm, I'm pretty much, I have the same opinions I express on stage. I get very personal about a lot of topics on stage. I'm, I'm I've I'm me, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a bit more a bit more critical, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. And you uh, became a comedian around the same time that you transitioned, correctly? Is, yes. Is that, uh, you mind talking about that? Is that a... Absolutely, okay. I don't care. Uh, you know, yeah, no, it was it was around the same time. It was within within a year of me starting. I think is mm -hmm. when I started doing comedy. So. At the time when I started, I had a lot of stuff to talk about that was very personal that was going on that 
I thought was very funny. Mm-hmm. Apparently, other people did too. So, was that a way of processing things that were going on? No, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I probably in the in the e true Hollywood, you know, whatever. In my eventual, you know, biopic motion picture, they'll make it out to be that. Uh-huh. But but no, I don't I don't think so. You know, I mean, I had my own. You know, I, I had a therapist. Like, <laughs> like what, that was what they were there for. I, I, didn't need, I didn't need stage time to go to work through emotions. Uh-huh. Um, I think some people would say therapy would kill comedy if they had a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't be able to say what they say on stage. And they'd be better at just it. That, that, well, that's the other sort of myth of comedians, that everybody... Everybody's messed up and they can't. They, they yes, do it because yes. they're messed up, which is... You know, some comedians embrace that, and some comedians... I'm like, no, I'm a regular person. Uh, <laughs> I'm not broken. <laughs> I'm not trying to convince you of that. I'm not broken, and I, uh, you know, that's not why I do comedy. I think there are a little, lot of people drawn to comedy that probably could benefit from therapy, mm. but don't go. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just that kind of thing that people are drawn to that, that may, maybe couldn't deal with reality, mm-hmm. and that's their way of venting. And well, it's may, maybe it's not therapy, but it, is it therapeutic? I think it is oh, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I agree. Is is there an element of because you have to define yourself on stage? Right. Is there an element of that carries over into your real life where you've made discoveries through things you about yourself, through things that you've written or said on stage that that maybe you didn't know about yourself or hadn't clearly defined about yourself i think i think that's happened to me i think there's Mm -hmm. definitely but a lot of those discoveries about myself happened far far before i ever got on stage and said it Mm -hmm. you know that was in the writing process Uh you know i I was sitting in a cafe writing stuff and trying to figure stuff out out to say on stage and about me and about my life and what i'm going through and all that other stuff and yeah sure i worked out some things there but I, that it wasn't a discovery on stage, mm. or a discovery through the comedy, I should say. I, more. I not guess necessarily through the act stage. of writing it, writing comedy, yeah. But so so much of it seems to be about refining a definition, which is something that you know maybe it's too broad to say this. Which is about what the rest of your life is about defining and and, and discovering. So that you you take that process uh, and funnel it into something so specific. It seems like there would be some carryover from from one to the other. Yeah, I know. Like when I when I had about ten minutes of material, I stepped back and I saw like the things that I was focusing on that I thought was, you know, in my comedy. Um, I was surprised at it, at how just simple and mundane it was. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also found that it was an outlet for me to kind of take back. Um, control of things you know things that really would bother me and not in a way that it's like this high like therapeutic thing but like you know when I was going to get my upgrade at Verizon um that woman made me cry (laughs) because it it just was just an awful experience for me and so I like I knew when I got the phone it took me two years but I'm like I'm gonna write a bit about this (laughs) because it bothered me but I didn't know where to put it so um that's where the comedy helped me because when you feel out of control or helpless, it kind of mm-hmm. gives you control. You're like, well, I'm just going to put something funny in this. Mm-hmm. Do you ever have one of those moments and then you just can't figure out how to make it funny? Is like, oh, boy, oh, this is something happening to you in the moment. Like, I've oh, this is going like to be that. great. Yeah, yeah. And then this is nothing. comedy gold. And then you do it <laughs> yeah. on stage and the, the audience either doesn't get it or you haven't phrased it properly. Right for them to understand where the funny part is. Mm-hmm. And you're like, you dump it for a while, but then you bring it back because you're like, nope, there's something funny there. And for me, I'll write it out. I went to school for writing, so I'll write it out too and find like the right words and placement and stuff like that. But I still have to do it on stage a couple times at an open mic night or in the middle of my set and to get the right timing and wording and the way that it flows. Because if it doesn't flow, then it's not going to be funny for me. Mm-hmm. It's like you have to get the timing down and stuff. So I still have to say stuff out loud, but I'll write bits down, and now I do it on my phone 
Mm-hmm. I'll like leave a note there and like there's something funny there and then I'll structure the joke around it later. Do you need the audience feedback to know something is funny? This is something I've, I've a question I've debated with comedian friends. I think I think you do. Mm-hmm. I think you sometimes you just have a concept that is funny to you, but until the audience like and it's not every audience. And until you're confident about that joke, sometimes you don't get a laugh on it. Mm-hmm. But you know from the reaction of the audience that it is funny. I don't know. Maybe you need the validation that it's funny because you're opening yourself up, these thoughts that you have in your head. Mm-hmm. That's why stand up so scary, to me anyway, mm-hmm. because you're vulnerable. Mm-hmm. It's a very vulnerable art. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not interpreting somebody else's words, you're not singing someone else's mm-hmm. song. Songwriting the same when you're a songwriter. You're giving something to the world that you created, and you're like, oh, I hope this doesn't suck. Or I hope people can relate to this. Or I hope people like this. And you're just shitting your pants, kind of, hoping that it's something that people like. And hopefully not literally. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) The whole room's looking at you. (laughs) Don't eat the romaine lettuce. (laughs) Well, I mean, with music, you can can practice your chords. You can practice your rhythm. You can get other things down. And there are some technical aspects. To it, and that, that I'm assuming that's with Kathy, what you teach in, at Improv Boston. Yeah. Um, that there are those technical aspects uh, of it. But then it's other than dance, I think it's the most subjective art form. Because you can do, you can pour your heart out from one audience and they hate it. Yeah. And you can pour mm-hmm. your audience out at the next, uh, your heart out at the next audience and they love it. Yeah. But that's, and that's the thing about comedy, I always think too. I, for me, it's therapeutic. I feel like I'm my best self on stage. I'm the me I like best is on stage me, mm-hmm. even if that makes sense. Even though it's the same me, but I feel like I am more focused. I feel like any other time that I'm not on stage, my mind is always a bunch of different places, and I have a really hard time just being focused and being present. Mm-hmm. Um, the only place I can 100% of the time do it completely is when I'm actively on stage. I can. I'm nowhere else mentally. I'm 100% there, and I feel like I'm giving my best self, and I really, really just love it. But also, it's my job. Like, the people in that crowd paid to be there. They got a babysitter. They changed their plans. Like, they made an effort to come out, and that's their leisure time. Like, Mm -hmm. that's their free time that they're giving to me. I owe them something. So for me, part of me thinks, like, it doesn't matter if I think this is funny. Like, I'm here. This is... For me, in that I love it more than I love anything else, but I mean, except my family. But like, th- as far as tangible, like the activity and, and stuff, I don't. Then, I don't <laughs> I love my family. Depends. But I love, I love, I love comedy more than any any other activity, bar none. So that part's for me. Mm-hmm. But my job is to is to have the audience have a good time. So I'll like skew, and I'm sure you right. You look at the crowd and go, all right, this is the age makeup of the crowd. This is the demographics of the crowd. This is the area I'm in. I think this is what they're gonna like, and I piece it together. It doesn't always work. Right. You cross your fingers and hope it does. Mm-hmm. And Sometimes you change your tag. You go take a yes. different direction because yeah. you're like, this isn't working. Yeah, because it doesn't matter how or you much do a college I love and a you joke. realize how old you are, yes. and you're like, oh, <laughs> this is gonna suck. <laughs> when they don't, when I do a college and they don't get like and sync references i'm like i don't even know what to do with you like yeah. that's my most relevant most <laughs> modern reference yeah i find that to be a challenge what i what has been interesting especially coming off the festival and being able to be on shows with these women is that we have although we're in this anyway we have really different processes mm-hmm. like i will actually watch um emily like thread a joke where she'll go in she has a premise she, she she talks it out on stage, which mm. I think is very brave. Um, and it's then just ill-prepared. No, <laughs> it's not. No, it's not. That's there, your there's process. There's a method to her madness, and you can tell, because then two shows later, she's doing this, but she's threading a different tag, or she's she's punched out the punchline, or she's taken something out of the setup. Um, to me, I'm fascinated by all of those things, where I'm more comfortable in my notebook um, and trying... And where I'm always working is trying to get as comfortable on stage, mm-hmm. um, where some of my re- being reserved um, looks like I'm being reserved, but that's just how I'm feeling mm-hmm. um, uh, at that at that time. But in terms of a joke, like if I know, you know, like instinctively, I feel like I know if something's going to be funny um, out of the box. Sometimes it's not, but mm-hmm. I will stick with it. 
um, or change it around. For me, it's always a logical leap. I, I've, I've lost them somewhere in the setup for the punchline. Mm -hmm. So I know what my, the things that trip me up usually yeah. are. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I'll try it anyway, and then until somebody can explain to me what they're missing, <laughs> mm -hmm. then I figure it out. Do you do your jokes like choose your own adventure? I kind of do a choose, like I'll start here, and then I'll go, okay, if they like this, I'll weave into this. Yep. But if they like this, right, like a mat, like, all right, mm -hmm. this is choose your own adventure. They didn't like this part. We'll go the other way. We'll go down this tunnel, and we'll take this boat now. Like That's why a heckler is so disruptive, because yeah. you're not just telling your jokes if you're a good comic. You're there are some comics that just into. come out do their jokes the same way they're like a used car salesman. They have one pitch, and that's mm. what they're going to pitch. And if they don't like it, they're just going to keep going. Yeah. Mm. But when you're a good comic, you look at what the audience is laughing at. You look around the room. You may have to say something with something's weird or something happens. You may have to address that. Yeah. But you're constantly thinking of the next bit and what people are laughing at and which direction you're going to go. And that's why it's hard when someone interrupts you yes. and wants to be part of the show because now you have to do stuff off the cuff to either shut them up or because they've disrupted the whole room and you've got to take the control back. And, right. that's and then what you don't know if it'll weave understand. back in. Yeah, and then you're like, great, well, now what am I, what am I going to do to get them back? Because the focus is on you and you're the one in control most of the time. <laughs> well, that's where it moves from uh, an art to a job and right. craft mm -hmm. and a profession i don't I, I don't think people think about comedy as a job mm -mm. a lot the, the general public i don't think sees it i mean oh. you're not i think they see you're playing clubs and then people are drinking at tables in front of you and that's or you're in theaters and you're you know doing the, the huge netflix show i don't think people think about like you're playing the, the uh, Comic Con tonight. That's why we're all here. <laughs> yeah. uh, you played, uh, Carolyn, you call them the Dead Animal Clubs? Is that what yeah, you the call Dead them? Animal the, Lodges. Uh, <laughs> I did a lot of those in Maine. It was unbelievable. You're not always That's at where I learned what a meat raffle was. <laughs> you're not always at the. You know, the <laughs> you're not always at a, a club. And, and you're not always. And sometimes even after you've had the whatever that what people consider that big break. You go back to playing yeah. the yeah. dead animal clubs. I mean, because it's a benefit, and that's where it is. Like I was just in Taunton a couple weeks ago. I don't mean to brag. And it, <laughs> it was the night where it was raining really hard, so it was pitch black, yeah. and I pulled up. There was no signage on this building at all. Um, it was the Lafayette Club, and it was scary. Mm. And I was like, this you sure you want to go public with that? You want to bleep out the Lafayette <laughs> Club in case they want to? No, they were all very nice once I got there. But it uh -huh. was just like you pull up, it's pitch black, there's no lights in the parking lot. You're like, this is comedy. Yeah. <laughs> this is comedy in New England. You know what I mean? Like, you're not always in a club and you're not always at a theater and you're not always in a nice place. Like, you're just going to where the show is. Yeah. Uh, Bobcat Goldthwaite has told the story about his first Letterman appearance. He was working at a Greek restaurant in Kenmore Square, and he had to do Letterman and then come back and, and tell people, you know, his the people at the, the restaurant, special. watch Letterman tonight. I would, yeah, you were on Letterman, right? Said, no, I am. I'm on. <laughs> he was still, and it, that wasn't the big, you know. Once you're on TV, you're not necessarily. That's mm -hmm. not the big break. Well, look at Monique it's, it's and one. her thing with Netflix and how they lowball. She has a she has a fucking Oscar. Like, she is an Oscar, and she's still fighting with people over how much they're going to pay her for a Netflix special. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any point when you've made it, and you're set, and you only play theaters, and everything's perfect all the time. I think comics, I think it's just not like that. Well, it right? used like, to be different. Like, if you got invited to the couch on Carson, then your comedy career kind of took off. Yeah. Right? But that's not the case anymore. You could do all the late night shows, and then be in a dead animal lodge the next week. Because it's just not like that. There's more comics. It's a different business. It's not the you know late 80s, early 90s when it was a big comedy boom. I think there's a lot more comedy. Mm -hmm. But like with all the specials and everything, I yeah. think the quality of comedy, just because there's more doesn't mean it's better. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it also, the, the reason that is also is because you get, they get instant feedback now. Mm -hmm. Like if you're on yes. Conan or something, you know, the, you, you get feedback from the audience. It goes up online. Mm -hmm. See how many views it gets in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're getting not that much, then well, you have a TV credit, great. But apparently the world didn't think you were actually that funny. 
Right. Well, even, even back then in the, the heyday, Steve Martin would talk about how you know nobody noticed who he was until he was 12, 13 appearances on Carson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, so it, and now it's all about how many fo- – you can get booked in a club now because you have a million followers, but that doesn't mean that you're the funniest comic in the room. Well, look, at that. we saw that at JFL, the variety showcase, the Southern Mama guy, like, bombed really, really hard because he thought he was just going to get up and do – Southern Mama, and it's like, okay, that's you're great in on Canada. YouTube. <laughs> yeah, like you're in Canada, <laughs> and that's great on YouTube, but it doesn't work in front of a live audience. Yeah, like, and that's that's not, that's, that's a you totally don't have jokes. different part of the business now too. That's changed kind of, tremendously. And Vine star, right? YouTubers and Vine stars yep. were getting booked, and they weren't comics by trade, no. like so they had no idea what to do. Or they were performing in their an bedroom, hour. and now they're not in front of an audience. And, yeah. and they're for an hour. Of, yeah, and you and have them. no props. There's no camera in front. Like, like there's no just, editing. Yeah, None it's you that. and them, and good fucking luck, because you were doing you know thirty second Vine clips. Yeah, how do you make an hour out of that? Yeah, there's a lot of things you see on there that don't look like they would transfer. To yeah, this, to a live stage, very well. A lot of things because you can use editing. Too. Well, part of it too is people are getting hours. Like, again, if someone goes viral and they've been doing comedy six months, I think we've seen a lot of that that you didn't. Those used fifteen to see. minute specials, you yeah. saw a lot of that. Yeah. Some were really good, and, and some were unwatchable. Because there were people who had a good five, yeah, and they got something six months in. I feel like that right, that never used to happen. You would be grinding away for ten years before you got anything, and mm-hmm. I feel like people now are like a year or two in, and they're getting JFL. And they're having a great set, and then they don't have any more than that great five minutes that got them all the recognition. Because they haven't developed. like, And everybody develops at different speeds, and the confidence in, I call it finding your voice, but like finding out who you are and being that person on stage. And people are getting things really quick, and then they they just burn out, and they either Mm -hmm. disappear, or you find, like, five years later, they show up again, and now they're funny. Because they went and worked at it. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, we were talking about that earlier, how sometimes you can see somebody uh, and they're, they don't really, you know, you, you might say, all right, they're, they're not your average open mic or they've got something, but not, there's not much there. And you can see them sometimes even, you know, six months later and they, they seem like a completely different comedian. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I but, think some of that has to do too with, you know, when you're talking about these 15 and these 30 minute things is that you go from spending a year or years on your five, your type five, your type mm-hmm. five, mm-hmm. and then you're kind of lost between your five to your 28 or your 30. I mean, that's exactly what you were talking about before, about being able to you know, hone or pivot or you know, not do that cluster, go into something else because the, the crowd's not connecting with that or they resonate with something else. That skill set isn't needed in a five, it's needed in a right. 30, and there there aren't classes on that kind of stuff. That's just like life and stumbling through that. Because mm-hmm. uh, I remember asking somebody, like, you know, like, is there something out there, like a book or something I could read? <laughs> like, I'd yeah. just like, uh, no. <laughs> no. It's like if you had to learn how to drive, and the only courses were how to turn the car on. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Right. Steering is all up to you once you're out of the driveway. Mm-hmm. Sorry, we don't know what to tell you. And I, and I think your stand-up set is a different beast. Also, like like the type of jokes you can tell change when you start doing twenty minutes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, twenty-five. I know that was that was big yeah. for me. Mm-hmm. You know, because like all of my material is transgender related. Mm-hmm. But like when I first started and I started first doing five, like my five had to be about certain topics. Mm-hmm. Because the audience is wondering them, and if I didn't think, if I didn't talk about them, then mm-hmm. then they did stop paying attention. Yeah. Do you feel free to to veer out of transgender topics if you wanted to at this point? If I had a longer set time, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Whenever I get, if I can get a longer set, then after you know ten fifteen minutes on trans stuff, I could probably start. You know, I I'm trying now to start moving into other areas, but. You know, how do you do that stuff even at an open mic or at a show I can get seven minutes on? Now I've got to spend, you know, four minutes trying to get through the basics mm-hmm. to then move on to something else. And it's it's tough, you know. It's a tough ball game out there. Yeah, it's a, I, have, I have spoken with a, a, a gay and lesbian comics about this before, about how, you know, do you want to do material that's not about being 
uh, about being gay. And sometimes, it's, well, that's that's a lot of my life experience. I, I don't, sure. I don't well, want to be. A, it's an it can be a niche, but it's also my life. But we don't yeah. ask male comics that got there's straight white guy comics who their whole set is who they slept with, what they're doing with their dick when they're alone, what ha- like their whole set is like girls I slept with masturbation jokes i'm laughing because i did a show once and it was all guys in front of me and they all did dick jokes and every I, single like, one i felt like i had to do one at the end. i was like, like, I, was like I think i'm show. supposed to do a dick joke I i've think seen I one did. of the traveling arena shows where the <laughs> guys told a variation about the same oral sex joke yeah and, well, we, and it was yeah. by the time you got to the third person who did basically the same same joke everyone was done with it but we again that's part of the like Oh well, dick jokes and masturbation jokes from straight white guys are normal comedy and standard comedy, and it's fine if the whole goddamn show is that. And then the one woman, like Aaron, is it's transgender not, all the time. Like right. your whole life is you're a trans person. It's not like okay, now it's time to turn off the part of me that's a trans person and talk about normal comedy stuff that's cool. And again, the 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 critique women people who are again not straight white guys get is, are you relatable enough? And it's like. At what point do we say, like, everybody's life experience has something you can connect with? And when we stop saying straight white male is normal and everything else is niche, I think that's when we open things up, if that makes sense. Like, it can, but in comedy also, I've asked John Panette, do you want to stop, do you want to do something other sure. than fat jokes? Sure. And I even talked to, uh, uh, sure. to Jim Gaffigan, are you afraid of getting pigeonholed as the Hot <laughs> Pockets guy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, cause it, so the, so comedy funny. does have that way. You... You spend so much time trying to define yourself yep. that that you can define yourself into it, it, into a corner, and then, then you can't get out of it. Well, the industry so wants so you to define of, yourself. That's too. a fair point. Like yeah. that's the other thing. Like I've had managers come up to me and like, "Well, I would manage you, but you don't fit a niche. I don't know what yeah. to do with you." I'm like, like, "Find yourself. All right, yeah. nobody's interested in that. Find yourself again." Right. Find I'm like, different. "Well, I'm not going to change who I am. This is who I am. So if you can't market me, I guess I don't have a manager." You know what I mean? Right. Like I just said, "Fuck it." At that point, because I was uh-huh. like, and I did. I'm thankful that I didn't want this person to manage me anyway but uh uh, i was like that's a shitty thing to say to someone like fit a niche like just find out what you fit i was like well (laughs) that's not your job like what do you think that like Mm -hmm. it was just the weirdest conversation and i was i talked to other comics about it and it's like if you don't fit a certain criteria for something or your age or whatever Mm -hmm. they're like well it shouldn't matter. Like, it just shouldn't matter. Like, mm-hmm. it, it would make their, their job easier, yes. But, mm-hmm. well, maybe you take a risk and you, uh, you know, try to market somebody just as a comic. Like, mm-hmm. but that's not, you know, that's not the reality of yeah, what, that's what, not would you, what, what would you want, say? Yeah. What would you say about, you guys, you still got to say something about that. I run into this right, sometimes yeah. I, if I'm going to write about something. I've had comics say, well, I just go make somebody laugh every night and, and, and why don't you ever write about me because what I, I can't say to them is, is that you do you make a lot of people laugh with the same joke I've heard 3,000 yeah, other exactly. people tell already mm-hmm. and you make the same 12 people laugh and you don't you know there's there's yeah. got to be sort of something else I've got yeah, to have a story to tell yeah. uh, I get about right. you and, and they're funny uh, isn't necessarily a story they're funny because is the story right yeah. so that that where that's where it gets tough that makes sense mm-hmm. yeah. right, we, have, we do have to wind down because I, I think everybody needs to to eat before your show right. it's, it's getting it up <laughs> but i want to say we we are at comic-con and i haven't asked any comic-con like questions yet so <laughs> oh God. i do want to wind up with this how many how many people here are at a comic-con for the first time I raised my hand like a dumbass. Uh, <laughs> this is Carolyn. I've never been to a Comic Con. Uh, so what, what are you expecting from here? Do you have? Well, I already saw some costumes, which I was the people watching is fun, and then I want to go look at some more of the uh, merchandise mm-hmm. and and, yeah. and see who else is here mm-hmm. for voices and things like that. But uh-huh. I don't really have any expectations. I'm just ready to go see something. Uh-huh. <laughs> And have you been to a Comic Con before? Yeah, yeah. No, I've I've been to Comic Cons. I I like going to Pax East and stuff like that as well. Video oh, okay, so you're... I'm I love this stuff. Uh, this, this is great. 
what are you lo- what are you looking forward to here? Um, personally, I'm actually thinking about picking up some art. I've been meaning to get some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle stuff, and when I was wandering the hall earlier, I saw some people with with a uh, with some cool art on it. So I'm thinking about swinging over there after this uh-huh. and getting some stuff. But uh, yeah, checking out the vendors, checking out everybody here, seeing the cosplay. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. And. Uh, my daughters have been going to anime, pat, comic con stuff for about seven years now. Like I probably should have remortgaged my house with the amount of wigs and cosplay. <laughs> and I have a tremendous amount of cosplay in my home, figurines. Um, so I'll probably be looking for my youngest, who will be in the merch room, um, uh-huh. <laughs> expanding on her collection. Mm. And. Finally, uh, yeah, I've performed it. I've never gone as just like a participant, just to like go and check it out. I I've done KatsuCon in DC, mm-hmm. uh, told jokes there like five or six times, and then I've done Aresia up here a couple times. So I just like I was I, the only cons I've ever gone to as like a just someone who bought a pass and just went. Uh, was RuPaul's Drag Convention twice, uh-huh. and <laughs> that was super fun. So I like cons. I like having stuff to purchase and there are similarities and between the comic there definitely and the drag are movie. and also con audiences are just super fun so uh-huh. i'm really really excited mm-hmm. and finally does everybody want to just say where you can find out more about your uh your comedy and yeah i have a website you can go to carolynplummer.com it's not caroline it's not plumber with a b it's uh carolynplummer.com with two m's with two m's mm-hmm. yes uh, you can check me out at uh, AaronSpencerComedy.com. It's not Carolyn. It's not Paul. <laughs> <laughs> uh, KathyFerris.com. And that's, you, you have a spelling, a different spelling. Yeah, I spell uh, Kathy with an E and Ferris with an A. Hmm. So. I, an E and no Y. A a e, no Y, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm EmilyRuskowski.com. Uh, just a, a it's S K I at the end if that's helpful, <laughs> or you can check me out at Carolyn's website yeah. too. That, if that's easier there. to spell, yeah, that's easier to check spell. out Carolyn. We're all I'll just link gonna it put to all your stuff on here. That's right. Well, thank you very much. Thank for, you, for Nick. Being this was really this, fun. Thank my you, Nick. first live podcast. Yay, Nick! Thank you. And thank you, Jim. Thank for you, being Jim. The audience. Yay! <laughs> to the hair. Thanks again to Kathy, Emily, Aaron, and Carolyn for being on the show and to the Northeast Comic Con for having me. Look for more episodes taped at the con in the coming weeks and look for the comics on Facebook and Twitter and go to the Department of Tangents blog at www.departmentoftangents.com to see clips of their comedy and other posts and episodes. If you liked this episode, please consider subscribing and or rating and reviewing on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. And now this week's featured track, Pressed to Death, by Illuminati Hotties from their album Kiss Your Frenemies. If you like your hooks with a sense of humor, this is the band for you. These songs are witty and fun, but some of the punchlines are in the music. It's a punk attitude, and they'll give you a song you can hum and a raspberry, literally in this case. Enjoy Pressed to Death by Illuminati Hotties.
Liam Young. 